why am I here? Mr. Schoenberg had invited me, and he thought I would possibly have something to contribute here. I'm not a photographer. I've never been at a conference of photographers. I've never been doing research about photography. But I thought he had a good idea when I looked into um, what are the issues that you want to focus on at this conference and at the uh, German Society of Photography. Um, there is a link that has to do with the work I'm doing, which is um, more focused on uh, the new online, the life in the online world. And therefore, there are three things I want to do today. Uh, I want to give you a brief overview of what I have learned is happening in respect to taking pictures. Uh, this obviously has changed um, within a very short period of time and I have been wondering why has that been changing and why do we make so many more photos than we used to do? And I will cover this with a few slides to give you an idea leading to my conclusion that um, taking photos has uh, very little to do with a new interest in photography uh, and more to do with the proliferation of new media. Um, on the background of this, I will talk about the research I'm doing and I give you an idea of what we mean when we talk about this new online world. Uh, and I give you a few insights into what's going on there because that is related to the fact that we today uh, make so many more photographies than we used to do. And I will finally address a question that I thought might be interested to you in particular, and that is a question that I've often been discussing with friends and colleagues who were observing other people making pictures, wherever they are, which sometimes is annoying, and which sometimes made me wonder, um, does that compromise my experience? And what about the experience of those who make the photographies? Are they not compromised in how they hear and experience the music or the play or whatever it is that they do, um, the fact that they put a camera between themselves and the world out there, does that not compromise their following or their experience with this uh, world? Uh, and there's some new research um, just published a few months ago, and I believe that's quite interesting. It was completely new to me and it changed my um, mind um, and my believing that this is mainly a hindrance. Uh, as it looks, it is rather an uh, ex escalator for um, an interesting experience. I'll, I'll get to this in a few minutes. First, um, and I thought this is a Society for Photography, so I, I brought nice pictures with me. Uh, this is just uh, an overlook about um, how many people have been doing photographies over the past few years? What has changed? If you had asked me before I looked into any data, I would have said this has been changing a lot because I see, make, see people making pictures everywhere all the time. It is not so the case. If you look at the uh, these are the years 2012 um, till 15. Uh, if you look at the um, blue um, column, you will see that people who actually make pictures more than once a week, and these are lay people, of course, these are not photographers, these are people like you and me. Um, this number has increased. Uh, people who make pictures once a week has uh, increased a little bit. If you look at the other side, of each um, display, and you look at those who make pictures never or almost never, very rarely, this is a number that has decreased. So there is not an impulse, there's not a development that says people today make more pictures. If you ask a random sample, this is done by E.F.D. Allensbach. Uh, this is a group of people um, uh, age 14 and older, um, a representative sample of the German population. So we do not have a new trend that means everybody's making more pictures than ever before. At the same time, 
if you look at uh, the interest, who is interested in photography? So who is interested in making pictures? And these are millions. One column, the blue one, are people who are particularly interested in photography. This has decreased. Those who are moderately interested, pretty much stay at the same level, same level also has decreased to some extent. And those who never or almost not at all are interested, uh, the numbers have increased. So there is clearly less interest overall in making pictures of the world around us. At least there is not what I would have expected. There's a huge increase. So that's one side of the coin. Now here's the other, and that is probably what has reached me in the past and what you probably have also heard about, and that is the number of pictures that have been uh, downloaded or uploaded on Facebook. These are numbers in millions. And if you look at the last, what is it, six, seven years, we see a steady and dramatic, certainly a significant increase. While in 2008, 17 million people have been uploaded on Facebook, in 2014, it was 351 million. So this is what has changed. Not the interest, not the interest in photography as such, but the fact that people today way more uh, upload or download pictures on Facebook. The same uh, applies to um, social media in general, things like Instagram, Snapchat. It's pretty much the same line. Oops. From from 2008 to 2014. Way more pictures. And this picture is what leads most observers to conclude that photography is the new way of being. People everywhere are interested and make pictures. I believe that's not the case. What we do have though is that people upload their pictures and share their pictures to a great extent. Does that have to do with a smartphone? I believe so. This line just um, juxtaposes or parallels uh, the proliferation of smartphones. Uh, this is the, the use of smartphones, and this is the number of people who make at least one picture uh, per week. This is pretty parallel. So more smartphones means more pictures. What we now see as the avalanche of pictures everywhere is mainly a function of the proliferation of smartphones. Now, smartphones is, and I already get to my second point, um, what I believe is changing and has already changed our world rather dramatically. And radically, radically dramatically, and unexpectedly. I've never seen in the 20 some years I've been looking at people using the media anything that has changed that rapidly and that dramatically. Many areas, almost all areas of our social lives are affected by this and making pictures and photography is just one of them. What is happening? The most important uh, step in this development is not only the development of the internet or the availability of the internet. That we've had for now a number of years. It is simply the fact that the internet went mobile. The internet is not something we access when we are at some stationary, when we are at home, when we are in the office. The internet is something we can access everywhere uh, we are. This is the number of people, or the percentage of people, um, who are using the internet when they are on their way. Mobile internet use. And this has, for the last 10 years, taken this development. So that is the main feature that has been changing. Just a few highlights of this, uh, more than 80% of the younger people who are the core group of those who push this development, more than 80% of them use the mobile internet uh, um, 
uh, daily. Almost 60% of them use smartphones um, and on the smartphones their apps daily. And smartphone users uh, are online usually around one hour longer than non-smartphone users. So the smartphone is the one thing that has made us all being online and has been enabling us to use the internet and that is happening particularly and first among the younger generation but it's now <coughs> diffu diffusing into older generations as well. What does that mean? Does that mean we only have a smartphone on us, we can access the internet? Or what are the consequences? What are the uh, processes that are triggered by this uh, development? This is an area we have been studying, particularly at the University of Mannheim, but also at other places, and we call this new area permanently online, permanently connected. Because it basically assumes that most people, at least those who have a smartphone, are not using the media at certain times and certain places. They are using them all the time, permanently. And when they do so, they do basically two different things that from the perspective of my discipline are quite different. One is called mass communication and one is called interpersonal communication. Mass communication is that we retrieve information from the media, today from the smartphone. We hear, we listen to the news, we read newspapers, we get the latest results of a soccer game we might be interested in. We are following the campaign in the US. Um, all of these things that usually were distributed through what was called mass communication is now coming into our smartphones. And we can use them and retrieve them anytime and anywhere. The other thing that's happening at the same time, and that's quite different from using mass media, is that the smartphones enable us to be in touch, to interact, to talk, to exchange ideas or messages with everybody we are connected to. We have friends, uh, that we send messages back and forth. We do not need to uh, send emails any longer. We are uh, using WhatsApp or if I'm in China, uh, they have another thing that's an alternative to it. It's called WeChat. It's basically the same as WhatsApp. Um, but everybody has one of these programs and connects to each other. And they share all kinds of information. That's not mass communication, that's interpersonal communication. And it's interpersonal communication not only with one person, it could be with a group. Many of my students have a different WhatsApp group for each class they are attending. So if I tell them, you know, this is what you have to read until next week, I'm sure they leave the seminar room and some of them send a message to all the other 30 students, say, what did the guy say today we have to read? And then 28 of them, of the others, probably respond. I believe he said this. And then somebody said, no, I don't think he said that. So there's a lot of communication going on simply because they have the opportunity and they have the possibility to communicate everywhere and anytime. This leads, and this is why I said, uh, you know, I, I apologize for uh, the slides being in German. Um, there is um, media and media content everywhere and anytime. Which also means that everybody can be reached anywhere and almost anytime. One of the few areas or situations where you could not reach uh, people was when they are on the plane. Um, that's over, you know. I mean, it's also gone. Um, until a few years ago, people enjoyed, you know, being on the plane and saying, oh God, you know, for a few hours, I don't need to check my uh, messages. Uh, if they don't pay, uh, you know, and uh, cannot be reached, they, they, they can be blamed. Um, so, everybody can be reached and everybody can be connected uh, with others. There are many ways and new forms of uh, using the media and of communicating while on the way, while traveling while doing it simultaneously to other activities and 
um, while doing it on the side. I actually do something else. But, you know, on the side, I also communicate with others. Users are permanently online, and that means communication never ends. No? Until a few years ago, when we studied the use of media, it meant somebody turns on television or the radio or opens up the newspaper, and sometime later, he or she closed that sort of exposure. Now nobody closes this. Nobody shuts off the phone. Nobody is unavailable anymore. Communication is constantly going on. And thereby everybody keeps in touch with everybody else and everything else. You can't afford any longer to say, I, I, you know, I didn't hear this. I mean, um, Donald Trump said something yesterday. Have you heard about this? No, I haven't read the paper uh, yet, so I don't know. I have to wait until I see it in the news tonight. That's over. Right? Everybody is expecting everybody to be aware of the common topics of interest at the same time. Which also means there's a constant changing between receiving and understanding and processing information and communicating out to somebody else. The roles have all been changed and have all been further developed into this permanence in, in what we do. Social media has become a kind of a background listening, as Crawford put it. Um, it is not a distinct source of information. Here is a message for you. It's always there. It's like the background noise um, that you do not necessarily put a lot of attention on, but you can, and it's always there. By the way, it also means that people don't feel alone anymore. That's one of the good things. That's one of the things why people say, you know, th the smartphone is the last thing I could give up. You can take away my television set, you can take away the radio, the newspapers has already been given away anyways, um, but you cannot take away my smartphone. The smartphone, I mean, watch somebody who goes to the office, or in my case, if I see a student who comes to the university in the morning and says, oh my God, I forgot my phone, you know. The person is not able to stand that feeling. That person usually goes back misses a class, but, you know, to go through a day or half a day without a smartphone, particularly among younger people, is, has become almost impossible. Does this have to do with addiction? Does this have to do with habits? With um, being used to a certain kind of um, uh, usage? Um, does it have to do with multitasking? The fact that we use different things or do different activities at the same time? And when I say multitasking, I mean just the behavioral aspect. You know, people who listen to a lecture and read a message on their smartphone. That would be multitasking. Real multitasking would mean they could follow both sources of information, which is not possible. That's simply not possible. I know it has always been the great excuse of people, you know, I can multitask, I can listen to you, professor. You know, it's fine, just go on with your lecture, you know, I just have to do this. I, I, it's not true. You know, whoever says this, we cannot multitask. The human mind cannot multitask. But we can use and we can perform different activities at the same time. And we switch back and forth uh, with our focus on the one or on the other uh, activity. Now, what we're studying with permanently online, permanently connected is basically at the intersection. It's partly addicted, it's partly habituated, and it's partly coming along with the fact that we are, are multitasking. This has two different components, one behavioral component and one cognitive, psychological component. The behavioral component of what we mean when we talk about permanently online, permanently connected, is a rather intensive, a rather strong use of media, um, but not one that is pathological. I resist the assumption that this is pathological behavior. 
it's not merely addicted. It has to do with the fact that we are used to it, that we enjoy it, but it also has to do with the fact that we don't think about it any longer. It's intensive, but not pathological. It's usually happening simultaneously, and it's particularly a mixture of online and offline interaction. At the core of what we study when we, call, when we talk about permanently online, permanently connected, is not somebody using the smartphone per se. Um, it is that we study somebody who is embedded in a social situation, who is communicating with others without the help of media, and at the same time simultaneously using the media. Um, my favorite example always is, um, and I recommend to go to a Mensa these days, you know, where the students eat lunch. Uh, they now eat lunch only with one fork. They don't use the fork and the knife anymore. They can't, because they take the fork in their primary hand, and in their other hand, they have a smartphone. And watch them. If they are sitting alone, if they are sitting with one other person, if they are sitting with five other people, it's usually a back and forth and the shifting of the attention. And we've already studied whether what's going on on the smartphone, you know, this other line of communication, this other threat, um, is in it or will be integrated in the communication they have among themselves or whether this is completely independent. Both appears, both happens. You know, sometimes somebody in the middle of a conversation says, you know, I just got um, a message here or, or you know, my, my team had scored or my team had won a game or this is what happened in the US campaign. And so it can become part of the communication uh, with the people around the table. And at other times, somebody is, you know, retreating from the situation and is having a parallel conversation with the person he or she is connected with over the smartphone. Um, so there is no more clear distinction between online communication and offline communication. There's also no such thing as online communication is good, is real, is natural, and offline communication, or the other way around, uh, is, is uh, artificial, is shallow is vague. Uh, it's hard to tell when one starts and one ends. Actually, nothing ever ends any, anymore. And in addition to this behavioral component, there's a psychological component which has to do a lot with vigilance. And that is that people who are not involved, who are not really showing a certain activity, who are not looking at their phones, still are affected by the fact that the phone is in their bags. There have been studies, um, colleagues of mine at Stanford University did a study with people who uh, were involved in an interpersonal communication. Half of the group, half of the subjects, half of the um, uh, people they um, asked um, was put into the situation with their cell phones in their bags and the other half was uh, they are without cell phones. They had to give up, uh, they had to give the uh, cell phone to the um, experimenter. Turns out those who had their cell phones in their bags, even without using it, they have not looked at it, even without using it, show less empathy, show less understanding, show less involvement. And that's particularly true when the topic of the conversation is substantial. People do not involve as much in a personal conversation, not because they have the cell phone in their hand, but because they know they have it on them. And we all have it on us uh, these days. Interesting um, observation. Because, and I have, by the way, the, you know, I make this about three years ago, I, I uh, did not permit my students to use the cell phone in class. You know, this is a hopeless endeavor when it comes to a lecture of 200 students. Uh, I cannot control what they do. But in a seminar with 15, 20, 25 people, students, I tell them in the beginning, um, you know, no cell phones on the table. Um, they look at me usually and are pretty much bewildered, but then they go along and they don't regret it. Um, 
I actually did this because you know, three years ago I had a class where stu groups of students were sitting in different corners and worked together and I was going from one group to the other. And as I left the one group and walked over to the other group, I turned around because I thought I had forgotten something and I saw the four students that I had just left all picking up their cell phones. You know, because I've been sitting with them for five minutes and in these five minutes they couldn't check their messages. Right? Now, Today, I tell them no smartphones in the class, which means, I hope so, that they can focus a little bit better, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't matter, that it doesn't impact them. Because there's a sense of still monitoring, still being salient about what might be going on, still wondering, could I, you know, this guy doesn't let me check my phone for 90 minutes. This is how long the class lasts. Did I receive an important message in the, in the last 10, 15 minutes? That's bothering. Um, I think it's less bothering than checking all the time, but it's still bothering. So permanently online, permanently connected, it's not only a matter of how we behave, it's also how we are vigilant about the fact that we could, at every possible moment, check what's going on. And most of the time we do. If you're not sitting in my class, you would do. Um, I'm going a lot to conferences. This has been a long time that I've been, you know, speaking in front of a group that I have rarely seen anybody checking uh, messages. Uh, among students uh, um, at, at, at other conferences I go to, it's impossible. You know, everybody sits there and you are the clown on the stage because everybody is, you know, checking messages that are more relevant to them. So that's what's happening. And in this context, the fact that on the smartphone, who is always available, also is a camera, changes the picture. Which means, coming back to the beginning, it is not true that the interest has changed in photography, but the availability of making pictures at every possible situation. How often in the past did we say, mm, why do I not have a camera right now? You know, this doesn't happen any longer. Everybody has a camera at almost every situation. If I explode in the classroom, I'm sure there will be pictures. You know. They will overrule my decision not to use the smartphones. They will all go with their hands in their bags and pull the smartphones and make pictures of me exploding. Now, on the background of this, of looking at what has changed in terms of making pictures and what has changed in using the media in general, one of the most interesting questions, or I should rather say one of the questions I was always interested in, is the question whether we change our experience of what we observe if we make pictures of it. I've been at concerts, I've been at events, and I've seen everybody around me, you know, pulling their smartphone and making pictures and wonder, why don't they go for the real thing? Yeah. They make pictures of which we know that they are not uh, looked at very often, not looked at again. People make pictures, they know they've been there, they, it seems to be kind of a reinsurance, I was there. I uploaded it on Facebook, I show the rest of the world, I have seen the Pope or um, Hillary Clinton or the Chancellor. I was there, but I rarely go back and look at my own pictures. Most people don't. But those who do this, do they not compromise their experience of the moment? Do they really enjoy, or can they still enjoy a concert if they're basically holding up the camera all the time? Or waiting for the right moment? And until a few weeks ago, before I actually looked into this topic, so I'm very appreciative to, um, to Schimburg for letting me look into this, I thought this is the case. Now, luckily, there is a study that has just been published 
by a, um, happens to be a German uh, scholar at the University of Southern California, and she did a series of experiments, a total of nine different experiments. So it's pretty robust finding. And her thesis is that people who make pictures of events that they participate in enjoy them more and not less. And I thought, this is nonsense. This cannot be true. And I thought, okay, I'm going to read this. I will tell you about it, and I will tell you why she's not right. But I'm not sure anymore. This is what she found in this series of nine studies. Deal is her name, Christine Deal. She shows that people who go on a city tour, on a bus tour, do enjoy and report to enjoy the bus tour more if they had had an opportunity to make pictures. You know these people who are on a bus tour and who can't, you know, look at the city through the, the lens of their camera. And she's done this experimentally. That means she, by random, selects people in one group that was not allowed to use a camera and another group that was allowed to use a camera. Random. And in the end, those who could make a picture enjoyed it more. This is the case for almost all the nine experiments. She did it with city tours. She did it with people who were sharing a meal, um, who were eating, uh, going out for lunch. I mean, if those of you who had been lunch just an hour ago, think about the opportunity of making, which you had, making a picture, or if you did not have the opportunity. Those who had the opportunity enjoyed the lunch more. Second, oh, this is the second. Um, same applies to, um, and she did that in a natural setting also with sharing lunch with others. Third, she was wondering, does this depend on the diversity of the pictures that can be made? Now, is that the same if I go to a concert and if I make 500 pictures of the same artist or if I go to a museum and I have, you know, very, very different pictures, of very different things, does that make a difference? No, it doesn't. It, it applies in both cases. People enjoy it more if they can make pictures of it. Fourth, this is even the, fa this is even the case if people cannot really make pictures but they think they can make pictures. They are told, you will be able to make pictures. Then it happens, there was no opportunity, and in the end, they enjoyed it more because they had the opportunity to do something that they didn't do. <laughs> Which basically means it's not so much about making the pictures, but it's about thinking that I can make pictures. There's two cases that are sort of directly to this? Sure. Yeah. Uh, this is done with uh, scales afterwards, after the experience, people have rated. The question was, uh, how do you measure this? And in this case, it was measured by scales, asking people how much did you enjoy it, how much were you involved in this. Um, there are pretty good scales that can measure how much somebody enjoys um, an activity um, that he or she had gone through. There are two exceptions. One is that in cases where the camera gets too much into the picture, it is not much of a difference. There's basically no more difference between in, in the enjoyment between the camera and the non-camera. You know, usually when people can use the camera, they enjoy it more. But if the camera is too much in the picture, <coughs> there's no more difference. When I say cameras in the picture, I don't mean, in this case, it was not studied by having people, you know, having the camera in front of their heads, but it was uh, measured in this case by people who looked at objects on a computer screen and could make pictures by clicking the mouse. And for doing so, they would move, you know, the symbol of a camera onto the picture. And thereby, 
sort of obstructing the view on the object. So if the camera becomes an obstacle that's in the way of what I want to shoot and myself, it's not. Um, it does not lead to an increase in enjoyment. You would say that's pretty, you know, I take this for granted. The more interesting finding, and that's the biggest exception in her studies, is that people under one condition do not enjoy the situation more if they can make pictures, and that is if the pictures they can make are not pleasant to watch. And she didn't use this example, but she used examples of pictures where animals were um, attacking or eating other animals. I, I just pulled this from the internet to uh, demonstrate that. So, in a situation when whatever we can shoot is not pleasant to watch, it might be interesting, but it's, you know, people kind of so are not pleased with this. In this case, they did not enjoy it more when they had a camera. Why that is the case is unclear. My assumption, hypothesis, is that by using the camera, and that could also be the explanation for all the other results, by using the camera, people are willing to be embedded in a certain situation. They go on a bus tour, yeah, it's another city, you know. They go on a, on a lunch um, uh, appointment, yeah, okay. Whenever they have the opportunity to make pictures, they feel, okay, now this is sort of, you know, something on top of the regular noise. I, you know, let myself more into that situation. Which means that otherwise, and in most cases, given the proliferation of smartphones, people are not really embedded in social situations anymore because they are here and somewhere else at the same time. You might be sitting here and listening to me and interacting with others over your smartphone, reading the news, or thinking about that. Um, when you do have a camera, you might make a decision to say, okay, now I'm here. This is now really what I want to focus on. The interesting thing, though, is that this is independent from the fact whether somebody is using the media or is in a situation without media. This is, for me, a, a nice picture of four um, uh, young girls who seem to be pretty, pretty embedded in the situation. I wouldn't say this is a fake and a shallow situation. They, they do something that they're really interested in, and they do it with media. At the same time, others get overwhelmed and do nothing with or without the media uh, with a certain focus. They basically just try to um, keep all the balls uh, in the air at the same time. Let me come to a summary of this. The magnitude, the vast appearance of pictures everywhere is not a function of an increased interest in photography, but of uh, the fact that people can use the mobile internet all the time now. The hour everyday dealing with new technology has changed fundamentally, quicker and more radically than in the last decades. I've seen certain media come and go, I've seen certain media contents come and go. I mean, think about the video game example of 10, 15 years ago where everybody thought, oh, this is the end of, you know, um, the Enlightenment because people are uh, now all playing uh, shooters. Um, these things come and go, um, and they came uh, over a much longer period of time. 
Nothing has ever come so quickly and has ever changed our interactions and our way of communicating as much as the smartphones did. And when I say smartphones, I just mean the fact that the internet has become mobile. We are online all the time and everywhere. Um, and that is the reason why we make pictures. We make pictures of the mundane, of the everyday things. We used to make pictures, I mean, I remember, you know, a little bit older, I remember the time when you went on a vacation and you bought two films. I mean, that was probably the max that I could afford. Two films with 36, was it 36 pictures each? Then I was well equipped, you know. My daughters make 200 pictures of anything we would do together, you know. Da -da -da -da. Um, because it's possible, it's available, it doesn't cost anything, it's just there. It doesn't seem, and I base this on this one, and it's not one study, but I base this on the work that has been done by Deal and others, um, that contrary to what I used to believe, it does not compromise our experience, the fact that we can make pictures. It seems to support it. It seems to give it another quality. My assumption is that those who make pictures are more willing to get embedded, to be involved in the situation in which they are. It's not taking them out of the situation, which I had believed before. It seems to help them be in the situation. And I'm talking about those who make the pictures. I'm not talking about the others who watch those who make the pictures making pictures. I know how that feels. That's a quite different story, you know. When you can't see the artist because everybody around you is putting up their smartphone. But for those who make the pictures, they seem to be more into the situation if they make pictures. This seems to me the crucial thing. The being in a situation um, and having and not so much the fact that if we are, or if we use media between us and an event, we are distance. That's a very popular assumption. And finally, I believe there's always a choice. Everybody always has the choice between getting involved, getting into a situation, or just letting it flow away and following the things uh, we do in many cases. Thank you. I have one question. There was one um, interesting aspect of that deal and others. Um, I thought, well, if you're not allowed um, to take photographs on a, on a, on a trip somewhere, um, you might less enjoy it because you are simply not allowed. I know nobody in the world who enjoys being not allowed to. So the contrary, being allowed to is normal. Usually we are allowed to do certain things. So maybe the reason why yeah. people were um, enjoying yeah. being able to photograph was simply because they had what they used to have. Yeah, uh, it's a very good point. I, I thought the same. <laughs> when I started reading about this research, and I, um, when I read the, the first study, which was about the city too, I thought, yeah, of course. I mean, people feel annoyed, you know, if they, they have to drop their cameras. Um, um, but she did actually nine studies, and this is the one result, the one difference that always occurred, um, independent from the situation. Whether this was a city tour, whether this was a meal, whether this was a film going on and you could make pictures of that, um, it occurred across situations. And that's, of course, we still don't know. I mean, there can be other reasons, 
But if you find a series of studies that always find the same effect across different situations, you can be pretty sure there's something that carries across the situations. It's certainly only the beginning. I mean, this will, I'm sure, cause and initiate additional research because there are many people who would say, no, no way, you know. Um, and, you know, what you uh, mentioned is what we call the operationalization. How do you measure this, you know? Um, and you can do this differently. There are behavioral measures. There are questionnaires. And they all have advantages and disadvantages. So only after some time, if you find a robust result across situations, across different methodologies, you can be sure about that. Um, this is certainly the beginning, and it was, for me, so striking that I thought I'd bring it. And honestly, when I started reading the article, I thought I'm going to use it, and I will kill it, and I will tell you why this is nonsense. I was a little bit worried, because it's published in one of the best journals uh, that exists, um, in psychology at least, and I thought, well, how could they, you know, um, accept this paper? And then I went through study one, two, three, and <laughs> I got more and more convinced I wouldn't say it's, you know, it's the final remark, but it's certainly an interesting uh, argument. Uh, by, by accident, we are surrounded by uh, six portraits of maybe Rococo or Baroque. And this reminds us what, what it means to have a picture of or a mate by or uh, for himself. In the pre-revolutionary area in Russia, uh, the, the Peredvishniki painters, young painters who went on the countryside and painted normal industrial workers or uh, like uh, people, uh, simple people, went to prison because uh, to be portraited was, was a privilege by, uh, by the aristocracy and it was a series of events uh, that these painters uh, uh, made uh, art or, or the art of portrait, uh, something like a democratic uh, or, or a popular medium. So um, they were hard, very hard punished. Uh, and uh, one, one hour ago we talked about the refugees who have their whole life in a, in a cell phone. And having a picture from by himself means a, a confirmation, uh, the, the principle I think, I think so I exist becomes the principle I have a picture of myself so I have my position, I exist, I am a bit more sure uh, of my life, and uh, I made a I made a project in Africa about housewives, ma maids um, uh, who who some sometimes the I say owners or the, the landlords didn't even know the name, even if they were working and getting up very early. I came in these families and I said, "Can I t take some pictures?" And people asked me, uh, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, of course." I said, "Not from you. I want to." photograph your housewife. And they were so offended sometimes uh, that they threw me out. Because uh, to have a picture of uh, one himself or oneself uh, gives a, a certain power and has already the, the psalm and the, the a nucle nucleus of uh, op 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 opponency. Opposition, yeah. I guess it was more a comment than a question. Yes. <laughs> Any more questions? You gave a lot of uh, examples of what if people do. They take more photos, uh, they take more pics, and they, they enjoy more if they take pics from journeys, from uh, food, etc. Um, the scientific question always is why? Do you have any theories why people enjoy more doing pictures or not? Yeah, uh, my, my guess is, and this needs to be studied for sure, but my guess is that um, since we are embedded in a 
in situations where everything is possible, every sort of information is available. You know, it's not hasn't been there for a long time. I very well remember the time when it was scarce to, to have information, have access to information. And now we can have anything, everywhere, anytime. Which, from a psychological point of view, I believe leads to something like um, a decrease in our interest in what's going on there. If I can have everything, yeah, okay, you know, here's this, here's that, uh, you know, 10 million things at the same time. What do I deal with? I don't know. I think one of our problems is to decide what we engage with. Yeah. Um, it's to make this more plausible. Um, I remember the time when, in Germany at least, we had three tele you know, for some, somebody from the US, you might not believe that, but for a long time when I grew up, we had three television programs. You know. And the third one was a regional program, so you basically had the choice between one or the other. And all of a sudden, with cable um, media, we had 20, 25, and now we have hundreds. We know from research that this has led to less interest in any of them, which is a, you know, a psychological thing that if we have the choice not between two pairs of shoes, but between 500 different pairs of shoes, none of the 500 is as, as, as appealing as if I had the choice between two or three. So I believe we are in... Hmm? Well, I would say it's, it's a matter of fact. You know, we respond to the availability by putting less um, effort and appreciation into uh, the alternative choices. And I often wonder, what do we do in order to make the decision? You know, my, my dissertation, a long time ago, was how do we make the decision about what we watch on television? Why do we change a program or a channel? You know? It's an absurd question these days. Um, today, everything is there, and it's harder to commit yourself uh, to something. And I'm not sure, people probably make pictures because it is so easy and they have a camera um, at hand all the time because they have the smartphone with them. And afterwards, if they are asked, how did you like that? They compare it to the same situation or to people who were in the same situation without having the opportunity to make pictures. My assumption is that those who could make pictures sort of make an inner commitment or give an inner commitment. Okay, now I'm here. This is what I'm doing, you know? And I feel it because I make a picture of it or I make several pictures of it. Thank you so far. As I get you, you mean that the, there is a stronger involvement in situation by doing pics, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, additional question, and why do the people put it Worldwide on net. Why do they? Why they put it worldwide on net. Everybody watch has to see the picture people made. Why? Well, this is part of the question. Why do people um, um, release so much information about themselves? Um, why is nobody concerned about the fact that some companies, particularly in US, know and some secret services, I mean, Whatever we do is known, and nobody seems to care. Um, why do people post private pictures? Why do they put experiences, intimate experiences, on Facebook? Um, again, I believe it probably has to do with the fact that they can. They can. This is now available. I, if I may speculate, I would say this will not last forever. There will be privacy concerns, and at some point, point people will have a, a sense of privacy that will stop them from putting... It's not about giving a picture to somebody I know or I'm friends with. I put them on Facebook, and when I do a job talk, now this is what I always tell my students and my daughters, uh, if I have a job talk in a few years, 
and somebody Googles me, you say, okay, and here you were you know, doing this and that, uh, sort of uh, showing that kind of behavior in this private situation. That's not the type of person we want to have in our company. And this is only one example. So I believe privacy concerns eventually will play a bigger role, but um, what we do observe, and I do observe it with some astonishment, is that people have no um, fear and no concern and no problem with giving away everything as private as it can be. It's a matter of fact, um, it's a philosophical question why that is the case. There was one more. Okay, a moment, moment, moment. I'm, I'm sorry, that, that's an answer to your, to, uh, to your um, advice. Uh, uh, it's just false. Uh, first of all, the link between uh, the use of smartphone for doing photographs and uh, Facebook and the, the other social media did, didn't exist at the beginning. I, it was impossible. At the beginning of what? In the, uh, at the beginning of the iPhone. You couldn't send a photograph yeah. directly to Facebook yeah. with the 3, 3G yeah. iPhone. Yeah. So that has come, you, you had said it's because we can, but it is because of the pressure of the, of the users that all this, that, that, that uh, social media had done so much with and about photography. It's a, it was a process. It was a progressive. Sure. Uh, oh yeah, and it's so always, so I mean, whatever we, so we look. it's not only because we can. No, 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 we it's not we because, had, uh, we, we certainly we not only. It's uh, certainly always and many, and many, and many reasons uh, for and this. Secondly, uh, we don't, the, the, the people who are sending open photography on Facebook or Instagram, it is not any photography. This is to be compared with the photographs within the family album. So the, 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 uh, the little number, which was already at the end of the 19th century, showed to friends and family, yep. but not all pictures. There are, of course, private pictures, really private pictures. Uh, they are sent uh, through chit chat yeah. and, and other uh, 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 service which which are not public at all. So it's it's just false to say we are sending everything everywhere because it's 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 not the fact. It's not the. There the are certainly differences what I make public to the rest of the world and what I make public to those who I am friends with on Facebook. My point is the threshold has uh, lowered for what I put out publicly. That is a fact that we can observe across all new media, people are willing to share more private information about themselves across the media than any time before. And it's, it's not one reason for that, there are several reasons for sure. No, my point is, yeah, but my point is that, yeah, but if I put a, okay, guys, <laughs> I, I know that it's, it's not really legal to intervene now uh, this private uh, bilateral discussion, but oh, <laughs> this is public. <laughs> so excuse me very much uh, that I uh, want to stress the point that yes, we can stop your uh, <laughs> talk now. Uh, Mr. Forderer, many thanks and uh, an applause to him. And, uh,